of our little hello sign, bye bye hello sign. Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth seminar in our series. Today we're going to be having a look at airbrushing. So what we're going to do in this seminar is first of all we're going to talk through the different bits and bobs that you're going to need to airbrush. Then we're going to have a look at airbrushes themselves. We're going to take an airbrush apart and have a look at the different parts. Then we're going to discuss paint and then we're going to discuss cleaning which is the most important part of airbrushing. And finally we're going to end with a brief sort of demonstration and I'm going to put a little bit of paint on a model horse and um, you can have a look at how I airbrush and how I airbrush on a really small scale. So the important thing to remember from this seminar is that I don't work in anything larger than paddock pal scale, um, so about 1 24th, 1 18th. The largest things I paint will be Collector and Schleich. Um, I don't paint anything higher than that and I paint really, really micro models. And I use my airbrush for pretty much everything that I paint will have a bit of airbrushing in. So I think sometimes we think, oh, airbrushing is for bigger models, it's for larger areas. But I'm going to show you today that actually that's not the case. So, as usual, if you have any questions at any point throughout the seminar, please just put them on the little chat that you'll find on the side of your Facebook Live. I've got that up on a screen everything that you are asking, everything that you're saying, um, and I will try and respond to your questions throughout. So let's get started. We're going to start off with what you need to airbrush. So the first and most important part of what you need to airbrush is, of course, the airbrush itself. So we have here a pretty standard cheap airbrush and we're going to talk a little bit in detail about the different types of airbrushes and what type you should get and how much money you might want to spend um, later but your standard most important part of equipment is obviously going to be your airbrush. The second thing you're going to need is something to push the air through the airbrush and obviously I'm going to hit this so many times throughout the summer. Um, there are two options here. You can either use an air canister or you can use a compressor. What I would say is that obviously buying an air canister to start with is cheaper, but you can get compressors pretty cheaply and they're a much better investment. They're better for the environment and they're also just a long term, a lot better of an investment. So I'm going to show you my compressor now. So this old boy, oh, oh this old boy, um, has seen better days has had a few replacement parts recently um, because it has it's had, it needed a bit of TLC and as you can see, it also needs some cleaning. So this is a pretty standard compressor. It has an on-off switch, which you can hear now. So one of the disadvantages with um, a compressor is they are quite loud. So obviously, um, depending on where you live, you might want to think about that if you're choosing um, what to use. Um, it uses pressurised air, it's plugged into the wall. It has adjustable pressure, this particular compressor. So if I turn it on, you can, oh, it really needs bleeding. You can see that um, the pressure is between three and four PSI. That's where I like to keep it for model horse painting. Um, particularly because I'm painting smaller things. You can probably also hear that it has a little bit of a leak at the moment and I'm still trying to figure out what's going on and why it has a little bit of a leak. Um, as I said, it's it's old and it's seen better days, but it's, it's still sturdy, it's still working, it still pushes air through at a regulated flow and that's all we really care about. You're obviously gonna need to be able to attach your compressor to your airbrush. Now, um, most compressors and airbrushes car will come with relevant attachments. So basically you need a piece of air tubing like this, and they will all have like different attachments. Generally speaking, if you buy an airbrush that comes as a set, it will come with all of the attachments you need. Um, so you can see here that this particular attachment attaches on like this, and there are also different attachments for different types of compressors. I found that this attachment is pretty standard for most of the airbrushes I use. I rarely have to change anything over. 
So you've got your airbrush, you've got your compressor, and you've got your airbrush attached to your compressor. What else do you need? Well, the next thing that I recommend you invest in is some form of tiny little cleaning pot. So here's mine, as you can see, it's very dirty, like everything else, it's covered in primer dust. And basically, this is where I can spray into to clean and to um, between flows and to clean between painting layers. So if you look inside of this pot, it has a filter. And that means that if I'm spraying through airbrush cleaner, I'm not going to be spraying nasty chemicals into the air that I might then inhale. Obviously, um, when you're airbrushing, you need to be using appropriate protective equipment, using a mask, um, and probably also gloves, although we work with acrylic, so you might not necessarily need gloves. So you can see the filter in there. Um, and you can get these pretty cheaply. And they also are quite a nice little stand for your airbrush because you can just pop it in there and it'll just stand there. Um, but you need to invest in one of these because you don't want to be spraying airbrush cleaner all around the place. So you're also going to need your airbrush cleaner. So airbrush cleaners, there are loads and loads of different brands. Um, I'm not actually using the Medea airbrush cleaner at the moment. I just really like uh, the container. So their 800 mil container comes with this like really handy little squirty bit at the top. So it's really easy to squirt into your airbrush. Um, the cleaner I've currently got is this uh, airbrush pro color. Um, you can buy loads of different airbrush cleaners. I airbrush a lot and I get through a lot and I found this is pretty good value. I did once manage to buy a litre of airbrush cleaner that was really, really good, really good value. Um, but I haven't managed to, to get such a good value one since. So you've got uh, your basic equipment, you've got your airbrush, you've got something to spray any nasty chemicals into. Um, you also have got some protective equipment. So some form of dusk mask. This is a simple dusk mask here. But you might want to use a proper respirator, um, depending on your uh, own feelings on inhaling dangerous chemicals, really. You're going to need a prepped and primed model horse to work with. So a model like this little guy here. And he's just been primed in a simple white primer. So you don't want to be spraying onto the original finished paint job. You want a neatly primed model horse that doesn't have weird cat hair bits on it. Um, and a nice white primer will give you that slightly rough finish. So the same as pasteling. If you've got this, you don't want it to be slick, slick, smooth. You want that slight, light, rough finish when you're airbrushing. And that will grip the paint really, really nicely. There are some additional things that you might want to invest in. So one of those things is this. This here, this ear thing is an ultrasonic cleaner. And when I talk a little bit about cleaning, I'm gonna show you how this works. You can get these relatively cheaply, but they basically use um, little tiny sound waves and water to clean anything. They're quite good for cleaning things like old coins, um, but I use it for cleaning parts of my airbrush because you can't always get in and clean those parts as well as you'd like. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk more in detail about airbrushes themselves. There are two main types of airbrushes, dual action and single action. So this airbrush here is a dual action airbrush. And what that means is that the button to let air out and the button to let paint flow are different. So to let air out, I press down. But if I just press down, all that's going to happen is air is going to come out. To make paint flow, I need to pull back. Now I can therefore adjust the amount of flow by using my trigger finger like this to sort of regulate how much paint I've got flowing through. I can usually also then tighten this and that can give me extra restriction. This airbrush has an additional feature in that it has a flow regulator here. I keep that pretty much on the same um, setting all of the time. A single action airbrush is different. You don't have that, that extra control that you get for a dual action. So a single action is something like this, where basically you just press down. And as you press down, both the air and the paint will flow through at the same time. Now, I sort of acquired this. We're going to go through some of my bits of airbrushes in a bit. 
Um, this is not something I would use to paint model horses. This would be really good if you were painting like backdrops or bases and you've got a large area to cover at the same time. But for the kind of detail and precision that we're going to need, you really want to be looking at a dual action airbrush. Now, when you're buying airbrushes, there is a huge range out there that you can get airbrushes, single action airbrushes for $4.99, and then you can get airbrushes for $499. What I'd recommend, and this is a bit of a controversial point, there are a few hobbyists that would disagree, is actually to just get a pretty standard cheap airbrush. There are top artists that are painting non-qualified, non-champion work with airbrushes that cost £20 or $20. You don't necessarily need to invest in a really, really expensive airbrush. They certainly would not be investing in a really expensive airbrush until you know how to clean them properly. Because if you do, you are just going to knacker it. So I'd start off with a cheapish dual action. And you can get an airbrush like this one for about 20 or £30 pounds from Amazon or eBay. And it will work perfectly well for what you want it to do. And there are loads of different ones out there. I just like this one because it's pretty and gold and I think it's very shiny. So I've got another example here, and this is uh, one of uh, my knackered airbrushes. So I broke this one um, about six months ago, and we're going to take it apart today and um, have a look at the different parts. Um, it's not very clean either because it's covered in primer dust, but also because it died um, and I broke it during painting, it's also not cleaned so um, because I, I literally didn't see the point in cleaning it properly. So that's quite interesting because I can probably show you a little bit about how clogged it is. So we can take it apart and have a look at the different parts. So the first bit we're going to remove is this front bit here. So this is um, the nozzle cap. Now most airbrushes will have two that have the little bit here that we can take off and then we'll have this bit here. Sometimes you might need some tools for this. And then underneath you have your nozzle and I'm going to need some tools to get this nozzle off so I'm going to need to find where I put my tool box which is here so this is my toolbox of bits of airbrush stuff so I'm going to need most of them will come with the tiny spanner I have loads of tiny spanners you'll end up acquiring quite a few so we're gonna take the back off first because we want to take that needle out before we take it off so we'll take the back off and you can see here you've got a nice long piece of metal and this little bit here now essentially when you tighten you're sort of tightening this bit and that's what restricts your flow so we need to loosen this off and once we've loosened it it's no longer gripping our needle and if you look under here you can see we can just pull and the needle will come out so this is your needle. These come in various different sizes to match your nozzle. So if you have a look here, I've got some different sizes. I've got a 0.5 mil and I've got a, here we are, a 0.2 mil. And these will come with matching nozzles. So I have some nozzles here. So I have a 0.5 and a 0.2 here. And you can see in there is the little nozzle. So we're going to place that down there and we're going to take our nozzle off. So this is how I broke my really expensive airbrush because I did this to take it off to for cleaning and it broke in the teeth all broke off inside the airbrush and I haven't managed to get it out. I literally don't know how. So these are really tiny and really, really delicate. So we're just going to peel it off gently and you've got here your nozzle. So this tiny, tiny little thing is where all of that paint flows through. Now you're probably not gonna be able to see this because there is no way my phone camera is good enough, but it is completely clogged. And that is because this has never been cleaned out. And I don't know if I poke it a bit, I might be able to poke a little bit of dried paint out to show you. Oh, I can feel it. Oh, I feel it, it feels horrible. Okay, you probably can't see because this is going to require a level of macro that I don't think Facebook Live or my phone camera can cope with. But there's, if you look, there's a tiny, tiny bit of paint there. And that's because this has, airbrush has not been cleaned properly. And so you could spend your whole life picking at this because it's like obsessively fun to pick. 
but I'm not going to spend the whole video picking at that small piece of paint. Okay, so we've dissected the front of our airbrush and you can see where the needle goes all the way through. So you can see that it comes out here and it would then go into the nozzle, but you can pull it all the way through if you want. Okay, so then you've got the attachment for the air hose, which is not going to come off because it's too stiff. But it is really, really stiff medical supplies. If you watched our tack making tutorial, you know that medical supplies are the key to all things. We can take that off there. And you can see here this little squishy bit. So when you're pushing down on your trigger, this is what's pushing down and releasing the air. Okay, so we can now take all of these part bits off that I'm sure have part names, but uh, it's not the end of the world. Okay, so we're gonna see how horrific this airbrush is inside. Also, you might find out why it wasn't stopped working. I did take it apart at the time. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Okay, so if you are doing this, you need to make sure that all of your parts obviously you keep hold of them. So there's a bit of line scale on this, and this is the problem. I usually use distilled water, but occasionally I don't have any. Um, and this is the problem if you use tap water. Yeah, you can see here, this is lime scale. Um, and that is from using tap water on your airbrush. So you really need to be using distilled water. Okay, you can take the trigger out. And if you have a look, your trigger has a little wibbly bit and that is what allows you to move it back and forth. And you can see, oh, that is so horrible. This is why we need to take our airbrushes apart regularly. And there we go. This is like the little trigger guard. This is the fiddliest bit to put back together. Okay, so, oh, that is interesting. Let's have a look if we can get that out. Because that might, oh, I don't think we can. That is probably why this isn't working. Interesting. Okay. Um, there was like a huge clump of lime scale in there. Um, you can see inside that this is not very clean inside and this really needed to go through. What we're going to do is we're going to put all of our parts into our ultrasonic cleaner and that is going to take us neatly onto our discussion about cleaning airbrushes. Now, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on precisely cleaning it because you can watch hour long YouTube videos where they actually properly show you how to deep clean an airbrush. However clean you think your airbrush is, it is not clean. And to demonstrate that, I've actually not cleaned this one here properly. And once we pop this in the ultrasonic cleaner to show how that works, we're going to have a look at this one and see how manky and horrible it is um, from one day of not being cleaned. So once you finish painting, the first thing you're going to do is make sure all of your paint is gone. So wash out any bits in here, get that all nice and clean. Use something like a little bit of tissue to help you clean it all out. And then spray through some distilled water. You can use that to just wash all of your paint away and make sure it's spraying clear. Then you can spray through some airbrush cleaner to get it finally um, that final paint cleared out. If you're then going to be using it again that same day or you know you're just cleaning between layers, that's absolutely fine. Go ahead, use it again. If it's the end of the day, you really need to be doing a deep, deep clean. And to do that, you need to be taking this nozzle out and actually making sure it's completely clean. And this is where your ultrasonic cleaner can come in to help you ensure that it is completely clean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop all of my parts into my ultrasonic cleaner and this is usually where I lose my nozzle so ugh, okay my ultrasonic cleaner could do with some clean water as well so as you can see I've been cleaning things um, basically they all come with like a little basket and you can pop all your bits in your little basket um, and you want to be putting your knee nozzle on something that it's gonna not get lost but I don't have a something at the moment. Where's it gone? Oh, that, oh, ha, 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 ha. That's what that's for, genius. Pop that on that. Um, and then you've got little springs, all your little bits. Any bits that you think might get lost, just pop them on. There, okay. And then what we do is we bring it over and we pop him in 
And we'll just pop that on whilst we have a look inside this other airbrush and we'll see how clean it comes out. So we're going to pop it back over there. I think it's actually leaking, which is a bit disturbing, but we won't worry too much about that. I'm just going to have to go off camera and plug it in because like everything in my life, it doesn't work properly and the on off switch doesn't actually work. So it has to be plugged in and I have to find the right plug. There we go. I don't know why the on off switch doesn't work. So we're going to pop that on. And you're going to hear a really annoying noise and that is the sound of our ultrasonic cleaner so let's have a look at how clean we think this airbrush is so i didn't clean it yesterday i just sprayed through some cleaner so what we're going to do is we're going to take our nozzle out and we're going to have a look and i suspect there's going to be some paint deposits so you can already see that there's paint deposits there. If we have a look inside, I can actually see that there's still paint inside. This particular design is a pain to clean. If I pull it, I can feel, and I don't know if you can see, you can actually see there's paint there. So I have a whole pot of stuff I use for cleaning. So these are the kind of things you need for cleaning. Tiny little toothbrushes can be used to poke in and just cleany, cleany, cleany. You've also got uh, little pokey old needles. You can use those to grab bits of leftover paint or anything icky, icky, horrible. Um, I also have slightly larger brushes. So you can use those. And bamboo cotton buds. You can use those to poke in. And if we take off our nozzle and not lose it, or break it, because that will ruin the whole demonstration later. Come on. Nice nozzle. You can see how fun it is taking these things apart. Oh, oh, it actually makes me sad. So if you look here, you can actually see the amount of paint that's deposited here. And that's because this hasn't been cleaned properly. All this has been done to this is it was sprayed through. It wasn't actually cleaned. And I probably knackered it by doing this. All in the name of science. So if we look here, we can see, oh, gross. So I can pull it out flaky bits of brown paint and that is from yesterday literally one day of me not properly cleaning this after use so this is going to be an absolute pain now because it needs a proper deep clean but I just wanted to do that to demonstrate to you quite how dirty your airbrush can be if you don't clean it so exactly the same in here flaky bits of horrible flaky brown paint. So we're going to just put this back together. Ultrasonic cleaner has finished. So reminder, you, after each layer of paint, you're going to, not drop your nozzle, you're going to spray through distilled water. The hard water will generate line scale. So you're not going to spray normal tap water through you're then going to spray through some airbrush cleaner your choice of brand and i'm sure there are people who could do these demonstrations and actually put stuff back together at a higher speed then after every painting session you are going to give it a full clean using something like an ultrasonic cleaner or using your kit of tiny brushes and similar things that you can use to clean it. I talked about my eye water that I broke earlier. Can you see the bottom of the um, nozzle there that snapped off? Can't get it out, pain. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is leaking though, something here. Okay, so we're gonna pop everything back together. Nice and simple. There we go, Bloop. There we go, that's a fully assembled airbrush again. And we'll have a look at how clean that equipment now is. And then we will move on 
to talking a little bit about paint. So, open this up. Look at this. Ooh, shiny, shiny. Okay, I'm making a nice watery mess. So, if we have a look here, you can see that it started to get some of that residual paint off or at least loosen it so you can see how easy it is now for me to just peel that off with my finger so if I was to then get like a little cotton bud you can see that actually I can get most of this stuff off pretty easily and sometimes it takes a bit longer and sometimes it means you've got to so you see how manky that is and put it through a few times but eventually you'll get it nice and shiny and clean and very good for coins as well so we'll pop that to one side and we'll just turn that off because it's going to make an annoying buzzy noise if we don't. And we'll have a conversation about paint. So I'm just going to clear some of these things out of the way because we're going to be doing a painting demonstration. So as you can see, I'm a bit of a hoarder when it comes to these things, but I have been painting for a long time. this is the most important part of painting your model horse is actually applying some paint now there are lots of different types of paints out there and lots of different brands you can use so I've got some examples here of some different brands that you might see and that you might think about using on your model horses. So, first up, we have um, a fan favourite, my favourite for many, many years, which is the Citadel range from Games Workshop. Fun fact, when I started using these, no one else was really using them in the hobby, and there was quite like a negative stigma around using them. But now, I think pretty much every hobbyist uses the Citadel range. They're absolutely brilliant. They come in a lovely range of really pigment rich colours. Really, really good for horse coats. You get some really nice reds and browns, some really, really deep reds, and some lovely dark browns that are just really, really nice. You can mix these together and you can pretty much make any horse coat colour. The problem with these when it comes to airbrushing is that you need to get it out of this pot and into this airbrush. And that is why you're gonna to need to invest in yet more weird science supplies and you need to gonna get some pipettes. If you can get a load of these really, really cheaply and you can reuse them until they break, and basically you can use them to suck your paint out and put it back in. Simple, it's not as convenient as some of the other brands um, and their new pots tend to be a bit of a pain because they don't stay open very easily, which is really annoying. But they are definitely, in terms of colour, the best brand. Another really popular brand are these. These are the Valaho Model Air. Now these have the advantage of being in these sort of little pots with, oh, that is gross. I haven't used this one in a while. Um, a little squirty bit at the top. So that means that you can just put it over and squeeze and you've got it in your airbrush. Really, really good. These are supposed to be already diluted, um, but sometimes you might want to dilute them a little bit more. It's worth noting that not all the Valaho paints are the Model Air range. They also do a Model Color range. Now these are not suitable to go in airbrushes. This is actually one of the colors I use for hooves, but they have the white top, so you want the ones with the black top from Valaho. Um, this is another brand that I really, really love, but again, not really suitable for airbrushing because ve they're very thick and I haven't really got along with these very well in airbrushing with the scale colour. So this is scale colour. You can get this from Green St um, Stuff World, which is one of my favourite websites. They do a beautiful range of metallics and they do a beautiful range of really intense pigment rich um, acrylics. I just don't I just don't get along with them when I put them in the airbrush I just can't get the dilution right 
Um, however, their colour shift ones that are di pre-diluted down and designed for airbrushing, that give you those beautiful shimmery colour shift metallic finishes, work really, really well. Another popular brand for all uh, like hobby makers is Humbrol Acrylic. Um, this is quite an old um, Humbrol, but they have the advantage in that although they've got not got the little squirty type pots, they do at least have lids that you can take off. Um, I think this paint has probably seen better days, um, but you can see that actually that's a bit more convenient than those um, Games Workshop ones. And they do also seal really, really nicely. Now there are also a few other similar brands on the market. There are quite a lot that use these little pots like this. So um, Army Painter are also the same. I find the same with scale colour with Army Painter that I just can't get the dilution right with those. So generally speaking, I will use the Citadel range. They are, as far as I'm concerned, they're the best, but the Valaho range I've used for a long time as well. Um, the only thing I find with the Valaho is they, they're a, a little bit trickier to clean and to get a really good clean with. Um, I find that if I've used them quite a lot, I'm spending more time cleaning than I am with the Citadel range. I also don't find that you get the same really nice reds and browns that you get with the Citadel range. And I honestly, that is the advantage of using the Citadel range. Now, whatever paint you're using, you're going to need to dilute it down. Now, I use distilled water for this, um, the reason being because I don't want that hard water in my airbrush because it does just create lime scale. So I have a little pot that's covered in primer dust of clean water and all I can do is just use my pipette and I actually mix it in my airbrush. So if I'm taking paint, and I'll show you this when I do my demonstration, I'll take my paint out, I'll put my paint in normally about here. I'll take my water, I'll put it in and then I'll mix and I mix in the pot um, and I find that works really, really well. Um, I mix all my colours and I'll usually just mix them here and once I've got them mixed, I put them down there. Okay, so I think we've talked through all of the basic stuff about what to buy, what to use, um, what different paints to use. So I think the, the best thing to do now is for us to actually have a look at me airbrushing. Now the problem with this is obviously I use quite a loud compressor, so it is gonna be a little bit loud. The other problem is that all my references are saved on my phone, so I'm gonna be making this up as we go along. But I've got a willing victim, um, who's maybe not that willing, and um, she's already had a couple of coats of paint, and I sort of know vaguely what we're gonna do with her. So this is our willing victim. This is a nice uh, stable mate para dressage. And it's being painted to bay, I hope. Um, she's already had two layers of airbrushing. She's also had some really light pastelling to give her a few dapples. And I was having a little bit of fun with the airbrush, giving her extra dapples on her bum. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a darker color on now, basically to shade along the top line. Um, shade down around the quarters, along the withers, on the neck and on the face. So that's going to require a little bit of precision airbrushing. Um, and hopefully it is all going to go absolutely smoothly. But the most important thing is that we find the right paint. So we're going to be using the Citadel Base Rhinox Hide. The base paints are more than the layer paints, but for some reason they don't do like the same colour in the different thicknesses. So if you want to use the layer or the air for airbrushing because they're thinner, but you want to use this colour, you can't. So you have to just buy this one. So we give it a good shake before we use it um, to make sure it's all nicely mixed up. And we open our pot and we're going to need our water. And obviously I'm going to be airbrushing at quite a weird angle. So this may go catastrophically wrong and I'm very sorry if it is. So when I put the paint into the pot, you're not going to be able to see it massively well. Um, I'll try and do it with this hand. Normally what I do is I actually put it between my knees. Um, don't do that because you get paint all over your clothes, obviously. Do as I say and not as I do. Um, you'd need to be using um, gloves. Usually I don't use gloves. Um, 
it's only acrylic paint obviously if you're watching this and you're using uh, materials that aren't acrylic because maybe you're not painting model horses please do cover your hands when using chemicals and use proper personal protective equipment so i use my pipette to get my paint and this rhinoxide is quite a dark brown color now i'm getting a tiny splidgen of water now the consistency I've always been told and I've always read is make sure it's the consistency of milk. I don't think that's very helpful because milk has different consistencies, but I think about, I don't know, semi-skimmed probably, semi-skimmed milk, you really will get a feel for it. And I also think it does depend on your airbrush and what you're airbrushing um, and your paint. And it's really a case of just practicing, trying, experimenting, seeing how you get on and finding what works and what doesn't. So hopefully this is gonna work because it was looking a bit clogged. So the first thing I do is I need to test that it's actually spraying through and it is. So I've just got, I spray it on there and we can see it's spraying through. And, and I've got the color I want, I'm happy with my color. So I'm gonna start by applying it to my horse. And you can tell it's a little bit clogged because it's not spraying through at the, a very nice consistency. So when I spray, I push down. As you can see, pushing down, nothing. Oh, that's, yeah, this airbrush is a bit dodgy. And pulling back, I get colour. So I do it from a reasonable distance. And again, this is about getting a feel for it. So I thought my airbrush is fine-tuned I know exactly where I want it adjusted to I know exactly where that bite point is and I know that because I've been airbrushing for years it's not something that I can sit here and I can teach you it's something that you just sort of pick up the more you use airbrushes and you'll see that I'm not going OTT with spraying my horse and you'll also see that I'm moving the airbrush different distances away from the model and that will affect the consistency of the paint so how close and how far away you are will affect how much paint you put on so when I pull it away like that what it does is it just blends it a bit nicer and I usually might if I want to just darken the coat down I can just do that by keeping it a nice distance and you can hear there that it's running out of paint if I do it really, really close, I'm going to do it down here where I'm going to paint over. You can see that it will just become, it gets too much and it's splattering and it's running. You don't want that. So you want to be a good distance away. So we've run out of paint and that's okay because actually she's looking rather nice as she is. So we've now got an airbrush that's completely full of paint and we don't want our airbrush to be completely full of paint so we need to have a go at cleaning it a little bit now so the first thing to do is to make sure you've sprayed out all of that paint then we're gonna just give it a clean and then we're gonna realize that we emptied the bottle well, emptied the water bottle earlier because we've used it up and we didn't refill it so we're gonna only use airbrush cleaner because I forgot to refill it. So I've got most of the paint out of that pot, but the airbrush is still absolutely full of it. So if you look, you look against my skin, you can see that it's still really, really full. So I'm gonna use airbrush cleaner first. And if I just demonstrate to you here, if I now spray that through, although there was no paint coming out, you can see that that is full of paint. We don't want that. So give it a spray through using your little pot because we don't want to fill our lungs full of horrible things. And just try and get some of that last bit of paint out. But you can see, look, it's still absolutely filled with paint. So I do a little bit at a time um, when I'm changing between paint colors. And I normally do water and then airbrush cleaner. I normally want it flowing through clean with water because I don't waste my airbrush cleaner. Um, but I didn't refill the water bottle, so we're just gonna have to make do with this. So if we put a little bit there, the other thing is then you can still see, look, look how much paint is in there. 
and you see how it spatters at the end so just spraying through a little bit of cleaner is not going to clean this airbrush if i took this off look at that look how horrifically horrible that is Ugh. so i can if i clean that out you can see actually just how much paint is still in there and this is why you're having problems with your airbrush if you're having trouble it's because you have not been cleaning it properly guaranteed you just haven't been doing it i don't think there's a single person on this planet who can fully clean an airbrush it's impossible so we could be here for hours doing this this is so much fun obviously but this demonstrates to you that when people say, oh, airbrushing is great, saves time, makes it a lot quicker, it really doesn't because you're spending 90% of your time cleaning your airbrush. Now, another thing you can do, not with airbrush cleaner, do it with water to help clean, is to backflow it and just block at the end. And you can see, again, that's just manky, 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 manky. And it's really manky from yesterday as well. Ugh, that's horrible. Horrible, horrible airbrush. So gross. So we'll do um, a nice big spray through. Doop -doop. And then we will, once we've sprayed that through, I'm using a darker colour so if it's not 100% clean, it's not the end of all. We will put another layer on. And you can see that if I tighten this, it restricts our airflow. So that's when you're using that dual action. So you're pushing down to get the air, pulling back to get that paint flow. And that's what you need to remember when you're using a dual action airbrush. So we will have a go at putting another layer of paint on our nice horsey. So I'm gonna put black shading on. We're not going to use that because that's dried out. It's going to turn out that I've put the black paint that's not dried out in the wrong place. Ooh, horrible. There we go. That's not dried out. It's not great. Ugh. So the other thing to note is if your paints are looking really manky and cloggy, I think I've just gone to hunt for black paint. Um, you need to be filtering it you do not want huge horrible lumps on this one of icky icky in your airbrush so you can um strain it before you put it through using something like a tea strainer and then you won't get the horrible clumps that clog your airbrush now that is actually quite thick so we're going to put a little bit in there and again, it's really just feeling this consistency. So if I pull a bit out and show you, that is the sort of consistency we're going for. Um, consistency of milk, maybe. So we test it before, check that it's spraying through nicely. And then what we're going to do is we're going to spray and do the legs. So when I'm doing the legs, I do like the same bit of each leg at the same time. Because otherwise, sometimes I forget bits of legs. But I think that's just because I'm incompetent rather than anything else. We're just going to touch that a little bit from a distance. We'll go over that with Haskell, I will. Usually. I altered my flow and something like Oh, horrible. So there we go. So we can see we've just put a bit more on those legs. And what you're not seeing is that I am adjusting how much paint I'm letting flow through by adjusting how far back I pull my trigger and this is it's kind of like driving and knowing when to change gears and feeling you just get used to it like no one can teach you this um you just have to keep trying and trying and practicing and practicing and don't give up because it's really easy to just be like oh it didn't work it looked awful at first your first airbrush customs will look awful. Like when you do anything for the first time. Don't think that it's going to be amazing straight away. So you can see here, just that I'm spraying from a distance, 
And because I'm spraying from a distance, you can see that that's actually a lot lighter than it is there. It's a much thinner coat. And that is just giving me a little bit of shading. And again, this is like feeling your horse, knowing what you want from it, knowing what you want it to look like, knowing how dark you want it. So there we go. Um, you can also obviously airbrush manes and tails like that. I don't like handling the bodies too much when they haven't been sealed, but you can in theory like airbrush stuff like that. Ooh. Um, but you can see if you spray it really, really close, it looks manky and horrible. Spray it from a distance. <sighs> My hands are covered in primer dust. Horrible. Spray from a distance. And that, I just do that on the tails usually to save myself a bit of time. I'll finish that off probably hand paint it. But if I look, you can get precision, quite a lot of precision, depending on your airbrush. There you go. And then you've got that nice little bit of shading at the top of the tail. Lovely. Beautiful. Stunning. Dusty from process. Okay, so I've got a bit of paint left in there. We don't like wasting paint. Wasting paint is evil. So um, we'll just extract that using our pipette. And what I'll do is I will clean this properly afterwards. Um, and have a look and see if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. So if you've got any questions about what we've done today, this is a bit of a weird one because I think it's one of those things where lots of people want to know how to do it. Lots of people have loads of like problems with doing it, but it's actually really hard to teach you via a seminar how to airbrush. The key things to remember is that the most important part of airbrushing is cleaning your airbrush. Um, and that is really what you need to be doing more than anything else. And I know I've said cleaning a thousand times. We've been online for nearly an hour and I probably said the word cleaning 80 million times, but cleaning is the single most important part of airbrushing. So once you've mastered that, the rest of it is easy. So I can't see any questions obviously. So I hope you've enjoyed today's seminar. I know it's a bit of a weird one. It's been a bit different from some of our others because it's been a bit more sort of me just telling you to clean your airbrush. Um, but hopefully you found it useful and giving you some tips and tricks to start airbrushing. Um, next week we are going to be having a look at preparing your model horses for showing. So what we're going to be doing next week is we are going to be looking at um, what you want to be doing before a show, how to pack them for a show, and most importantly, how to prepare your head models and your CTF models for showing. So I hope you enjoyed today's seminar. Um, I'm sorry it was a bit of a weird one. It was a little bit bitty. Um, if you have any questions, the discussion post is up. Post your questions in there. And feel free to share any pictures of some airbrushed customs that you've created. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, 